I'd like to introduce our guest on today's program. Robin Donica is the founder and CEO of Zensho Agency, a multinational corporation and one of Japan's most highly awarded and innovative recruitment firms. Zensho, which means whole life, reflects Robin's belief that life should be lived holistically with purpose, passion, and presence. He recognizes that connections can change lives, and his mission is to fulfill his. Why? By helping others fulfill theirs. Robin is also a martial artist, breathwork and mindfulness teacher, and an executive coach who is passionate about transforming the lives of the clients he serves. He has lived in Japan for over 25 years. Welcome to the program, Robin. Hey, Michael. Great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. You are welcome. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you with us today, and I can't wait to learn more about your coaching practice and uh, understand the uniqueness that you bring to your coaching. So I'm just going to jump right into it and ask you the first question. Yeah, let's do it. So clearly from your introduction, you're active professionally. Where does executive coaching fit into your world? Yeah, good question. As you know, I've been running a recruitment firm uh, in Japan for the last, God, last 20, almost last 25 years. And throughout that time, coaching kind of crept in in terms of my role as, as the CEO of the company. You know, if you can imagine what it's like, we've got 30 professional recruiters and uh, our business model is, is a little different to the traditional recruitment firm in that all of our recruiters are, are independent contractors. So they all essentially run their own businesses on our platform. Um, so I, I discovered uh, quite early on that trying to get 30 very, what's the word I'm looking for here, very uh, dominant, <laughs> assertive people, um, uh, you know, how to get them all in, on board and in line and, and to, to embody and embrace our culture and the policies that we have and, and to work as a community. Um, it can be challenging at times, and uh, I think the expression herding cats comes to mind sometimes. But um, I found that the more I was able to bring a coaching approach to, uh, to my people, to my role, um, the more effective I was in terms of getting the kind of results that, that made the community stronger. And then a few years ago, I decided, well, maybe it's time to actually get some formal training in this area. And of course, I have you to thank for uh, being one of my first instructors in, in the whole coaching methodology um, uh, scheme of things, and um, which was very helpful. And I since went on to do some other training and studying and the rest of it. And uh, it's all been very, very helpful. And in addition to actually running this recruitment firm, I am also an executive coach. So uh, doing it separately to, to my recruitment business. I bring that into my recruitment work, often as a career coach with some of the senior candidates um, that we you know, work with in terms of their career plans and so on. Um, and also with some of the organizations that we work with, when we introduce a new person, a new senior executive, often that first 90 days is quite critical to make sure that this person onboards um, in, in, in the most effective manner. So there's some coaching happening at that side, but I also coach people totally separate to anything to do with my recruitment work as well. Right. Okay. So I understand that you're coaching inside of Zen Show and outside with your own clients as well. Right. So how have you distinguished your style of coaching from other executive coaches? I'm probably not your typical traditional executive coach. And, and there are many great people out there who, who can offer that um, approach. Something that's been really um, important to me personally over the last 20 years, I suppose, is, uh, is, is matters regarding your know, mindfulness, meditation, uh, breath work, you know, probably five years ago, anyone talking about breath work was probably seen as a bit on the fringe, but it's becoming a bit more mainstream now and seeing how that all relates to one's uh, narrative, you know, the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are, um, about our environment, about just life and, and the events that happen uh, around us. And for me, bringing that all together and really uh, looking at things such as, you know, presence and, and being mindful and being in the here and now, I found it remarkably effective in, in helping clients address the core issues, getting really to the crux of the issues that, you know, often they, they might feel, look, I, I have, uh, I want to work more on my delegation skills or my team leadership skills or management or, or whatnot. And these are real things that, that need to be addressed. But what I found is often that we need to take a step back. We need to go a bit deeper and really start to look at how this person sees themselves. How are they viewing the world? 
and looking at this kind of narrative context. And, and that I found has been really, it's, 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 it's not so much about putting a Band-Aid on a, on a tiger bite. You know, it's not just a, 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 a do this or do that. It's really looking at the cause. How did we get to this position? How, do, how, do we, how did you arrive at this perspective, this worldview? And I found the more I can do that, the more I can be you know, radically present um, with the people I'm coaching, there's some remarkable, wonderful um, things that can arise in those sessions that, that really trigger genuine, lasting growth. Tell me a little bit more about that by describing how you've introduced your martial arts training or meditation and mindfulness to the betterment of a client. I'd, I'd like to hear more. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, as you mentioned, I've um, I studied martial arts and that's one of the main reasons. Uh, well, actually, it was the only reason I originally went to Japan with the idea oh. of staying for a year, which turned into 25 years. Um, and the, the more time you spend with martial arts, the more you come to realize that it goes way beyond just learning how to punch and kick or defend your. It's of course, it's through that vehicle that you actually can tap into um, a much deeper essence and, and, and purpose of what the arts are about. And for me, what I found was this wonderful complementarity, this, this synergy, this interdependence between the, the principles of martial arts, the principles of mindfulness, and really the principles of business, the principles of entrepreneurialism, the, 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 the principles of, of life. And for me, martial arts are a wonderful way of bringing yourself back to your body bringing yourself back to here and now and out of your mind. You know, when you're training, you know, the, the teachers are always, uh, always asking us to stop thinking about what the opponent might do or what you might do if this happens and be very present, be very present in your mind. And martial arts are a wonderful um, uh, modality for bringing people back to their bodies. You know, for those two hours in the dojo, um, all the problems you have and the worries you have about tomorrow or the issues you're dealing with in the office or maybe at home for those two hours on the mat, those things, you can put them aside and just be fully present. And you find that after training, you become a, a lot more refreshed, a lot more alert, a lot more present um, with, with your own mind, with your own body. So I found that bringing that into my coaching sessions, of course, I'm not fighting my, my, my clients in the session. I'm not asking them to do any crazy uh, martial arts poses. But it's through, through this um, approach of, of really seeing how people are situated. When, when, you know, I had a, a good example. I had a, a client come um, into my office uh, a couple of weeks ago. And they were running a bit uh, for the session. And they came down and they could see they were hunched up. They were huffing and puffing. You could tell they'd had a tough day. And they wanted to get straight into it. And I knew... At that moment, there was so much going on in their mind and that we just took a few moments to breathe. And then well, I wasn't trying to do a breath work session or anything, just a few minutes to breathe and get centered. And there was this wonderful moment where you see this shift when the person was able to relax and let go. And it was from there, we had a much more, um, uh, much more valuable discussion about what was happening. That is such a good example, Robin, that uh, I think some executive coaches get caught up in the idea that we should just go right to the problem instead of taking a step back, as you said, and, and maybe grounding the client first and preparing the coaching space, right? That's one of the coaching competencies is just preparing the coaching space and making a space available. And it sounds like you did exactly that with taking them through some breathing exercises, just not, not as a basis for the whole session, but to be able to then get calm, get focused and maybe step away from the, the, the hectic nature of the day and really get into this conversation right now, be here now. Well, yeah, on, on that, I, I, it's something I've come to believe very, very passionately is that everything you need in a coaching session is available in that field, in that space that you're mm -hmm. holding here and now. And, and it's not necessarily, I, th I think that's where the growth happens. It's, it's where the, wor the work happens during the session. I think, you know, there are some coaching approaches perhaps, or some coaches that might um, feel the session is about getting the information out and then it's about the homework. It's about the work you do afterwards. But for me, I found that that growth, those, those, those shifts um, in, in one's narrative, in one's perspective, it happens, it should happen and it can happen in the sessions. And so it's, it's quite liberating as a coach as well, because it's not about you know, arming yourself with all these tools and I've got to come up with some great questions and make sure I, I sound like a great coach. 
it's about being radically present. It's about holding the space and trusting that what you need, what needs to emerge can happen in that in that field, in that space um, here and now. It's all yeah. there in front of you for both, for both parties. Right, right, yeah, well said. So I'm guessing that you've coached leaders now in Australia and Japan based on your global footprint. Do you see any differences in the way leaders think and operate in the two countries? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. And, you know, you could even take it a step further and seeing how, say, Japanese leaders lead within a Japanese organization versus Japanese leaders leading within an international organization. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have foreign leaders in, in Japan and foreign leaders, say, um, outside of Japan. So um, I, I think there's no, there's no uh, fixed stereotype or, you know, this, you know, the Japanese are like this and the non-Japanese are like that. But um, there are some kind of trends, I think, you know, typically speaking, um, Japanese people tend to be a bit more reserved and, you know, it, it, it can take, um, that's, what, that's why I think the, the approach you take with a Japanese executive is, is very, very important. Uh, trust is incredibly important. I think a person needs to know that they are, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to open up. It's okay to share. Um, something about yourself or about your team or about your company, if that's what's necessary for you to, to, to move forward. So I think um, by and large, uh, non-Japanese executives, are, are, you know, it's, it's more of our conditioning, I think. We're more, we're more used to speaking about what's on our mind. We're more used to you know, uh, uh, sharing our thoughts and opinions. And I think it can be a bit more of a challenge to, to get that out, um, to, to, to bring that out into the open, into the field. Um, with, with, you know, I'm, I'm being slightly stereotypical here, but with, with a lot of the traditional Japanese cultural way of being. And so do you have to spend more time creating that, that safe space, developing that trust? Does it, does it take longer as a, as a coach in Japan versus maybe working with a, a Western leader? Yeah, I think so. And I, I would say that, um, Coaching is what's well, not new to Japan. It's it's something that hasn't been as readily embraced because sure we see this in the states and, and elsewhere as well. But the idea that you're going to a coach for many Japanese still feels like they're failing in some way, or it's a punishment if your if your boss has uh, recommended or suggested um, you know you speak to a coach. So I think it's it's um, you're putting some of those concerns, addressing some of those concerns early on. And that's why, as I, as I pointed to earlier, I think the, the kind of approach I've been working with um, is really good because it allows the client not to have to go straight into what's wrong or what do you think, but really allowing them to settle into the space and look at their story. Because, and so much, particularly in the Japanese country, so much of the issues that I hear stem from the environment and that they're in. And I think there's an old expression that you can't take a changed person and put them back in an unchanged environment because the environment will always win. And to some degree, I think that's quite true. Um, you know, it's, we always have to look at the issue that someone might be raising in a, in a much broader context of their, not just their own story and narrative, but also that larger narrative of the organization or the team they're part of, the company they're part of, you know, and even you can, go beyond that, the culture and the society that they're part of as well. So that becomes, I think, very a very effective approach, particularly with, with, a, with a group of people or, or, or a, you know, a nationality and a culture that is very much conscious of how they fit. You know, you, you, you know this well, Michael, you know, you'll often hear Japanese people say, you know, we Japanese, it's a very, it's, it's, they speak very collectively as they know they have a very unique approach and they're very conscious of fitting in you know, the, the nail that sticks out will be hammered down is a, is a very common expression in Japan. And uh, it's, it's being aware of these cultural uh, narratives that can be very, very powerful, regardless of one's individual story as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, that uh, detailed elaboration on that, because it, it really helps us to understand that as a global coach, you do have to understand uh, people's cultures and, uh, and values and how their societies operate in order to uh, fit, fit within those existing uh, structures, right? You can't just tell people, well, just ignore that. You know, just, just act, at, well, how would you operate if that wasn't true? And it, it's only true in your mind. I mean, we can, we can say those things, but it, it's pretty hard to convince someone to just remove themselves from all that. 
in the US perhaps, or Australia, we might say, look, if 29 other, let's say it's just um, women are interviewing for this role. If 29 other women are, are all wearing a black dress, in the West, we might say, wear a red dress. So, so you stand out. Everyone remembers the person in the red dress. You were different, right? But you know, if you do that in Japan, you're going to be seen as, why are you wearing a red dress? Why are you trying to be different? What, you know, why are you trying to stand out? And it, w- it, would be, it wouldn't be effective. So then the question comes, well, how can you be memorable? How can you make an impact yet still respecting you know, the cultural kind of uh, scaffolding or, the, or what's expected of you in this cultural context? And uh, so there's a lot of that that happens in certainly in the, in the discussions I have with people here. Yeah, very interesting. So, so coming, coming back to the idea of coaching somebody, uh, say, and, and now let's look at the beginning when someone is considering being coached by you. How do you decide, Robin, if someone is coachable? You know, I, I certainly prefer to speak, you know, to work with people who are coming through their own volition. Um, I, I'm probably less, less, I mean, I'm sure there are other great coaches to deal with, with the, other, the other side. But, but for me, it's definitely more effective, ultimately, when the person wants to be coached and sees the value of that and really wants to, to make change. Um, and look, I think um, a few, a few uh, traits that are really important in in identifying in yourself, but also in those that you might coach, is that does the person have the courage? Do they have the, uh, I guess, the humility and the self-discipline to to go through the coaching process? Because if any of those three things are not in place, it's probably going to be a failed um, failed initiative. Because you've got to you've got to be willing to look yourself in the mirror. You've got to be willing to to listen to the stories you tell about yourself or the situation or you know the, the, the people that you have an issue with or whatever and try to step out of your story and see how it could be from other perspectives and things like that and that can be painful that can be very very um this, you know, uncomfortable very very challenging and confronting and um that's where the courage i think is really really important and of course the discipline to to just to go through the process to do this to do it when it, it's like going to the gym you know it sucks to get up at 5 30 in the morning on a cold rainy day but do you have that discipline to go through it because you know at the end of the tunnel there is growth and as we know michael you know growth is generally on the other side of the things that we fear and if we can go through that door well then usually speaking um some good things await us how about client attraction have, have you found that something tends to work to attract clients to you yeah, and it might sound overly simplified, <clears throat> but doing a great job, you know, over delivering, giving great service, and all all of my uh, coaching clients have come through word of mouth, and um, hopefully that means satisfied clients. Um, and and I think what's been really important in you know before the coaching engagement is you know when I meet someone who I think I don't just start giving a spiel about, about oh, I'm a coach and have you thought about coaching or anything like that. If someone is mentioning an issue or a challenge they're dealing with, I'll give, I'll, I'll talk for free, you know, free advice and a free discussion about that. I will try to talk with the person, give them, what's the word, try, be- not try before you buy, but give them, give them an experience. I think that's the word I'm looking for. Give them an experience of you. What, so they might have that experience with you before they even know you're a coach. And then they discover you're a coach and then they get back in touch with you and say, oh, I heard you're a coach or I understand you're a coach. And I'd like to talk with you further about what we were discussing at the party the other day or something like that. So giving people an experience of what it's like to work with you, of how present you are, of how you listen. And, and don't fall into that advice trap of just trying to solve the problem or you know, provide solutions that haven't been necessarily asked for or that you probably don't know anything about. You know, we, we, I think we, we're all guilty of it sometimes of giving advice and solutions about things we only know, you know, one small part of the story about. So um, that's a long-winded, muddled way of saying giving someone an experience of what it's like to work with you. That's been my best, um, you know, calling card, my best ad- advertisement, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I could see how that would work. And, and, and it, it, actually caused me to think back to something that you had said, which was radical presence, right? Mm-hmm. That when we encounter someone with radical presence, I think we feel different. We feel that we're having a different kind of conversation with a different kind of person because so many people aren't radically present. They're radically not present or partially present. And, uh, and that seems to be the norm. 
in uh, many situations. So I'm guessing that you're giving off a, a vibe also of that radical presence. And what happens when you're present? When you're present, you, you, you step out of your mind for a moment. You step, th th look, the mind is a wonderful tool. We need it when we're planning a holiday, planning a business, uh, doing this, doing that. Of course we have to think and we have to use our brain and, and all, the, all the tools that we have, the faculties we have. But when you're totally present and we hear these things like the flow state and, and in the zone, there's this, for one of a better word, an absence of story, an absence of, of, of self identity in a sense. There's just this beautiful presence and the flow of everything that's here and now. And I found in those moments of presence, we're not going into the past and uh, conditioning and reacting to the story of what's happened. And we're not also going into the future. We're not projecting into what could happen and our fears and anxieties about that. We're here and now. And when you are present, you're able to respond rather than react. We react from our stories. We react from our conditioning. But when we're present, we can put that aside. We can, step, we can transcend that, at least for that moment, and respond. And we respond much more spontaneously, much more appropriately, much more uh, responsibly, I found when we are able to just respond to what is rather than, than reacting to what was or what could be. Mm. Oh, thank you for that, that further explanation of what radical presence looks and feels like. Uh, I, I think it's very, very helpful to hear that. So I have one final question to ask Robin, and, it, and it's really kind of more about your coaching practice as, as a whole. Do you plan to make any changes to your coaching practice in 2022? And what, what might that look like? Yeah, and it's increasing. Uh, which is nice. And I, I, I plan to, I think this is definitely what I was born to do and what I love doing. I mean, ever since I've, I've been a child, I mean, you've heard of Simon Sinek, obviously, and, uh, you know, finding your why and discovering your why. And I, I of course, I always knew it, but I, I formally discovered it, I guess, uh, you know, a, a several years ago. But uh, I, I discovered uh, a, a talk by Simon recently, and he said, your why actually develops or kind of falls into place in your early years, like in your teenage years. But the way you express it obviously changes through, through, through your life. And I thought about that and I reflected back on my life and I thought, yeah, actually what, I, what my why is, 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 has been the same since I can remember, as early as I can remember. And it's very much focused on helping people fulfill their potential, wake up to just how truly powerful and how much potential they have and that's that's never changed whether it's through my vocation my work um as a coach or, or as a business leader or even simply as a friend um so that's that's kind of an introduction to your to to the answer i'm, I'm hoping to give here which is i would like to i've seen so much value in the mindfulness component the meditation component that i i feel it's such a powerful thing to bring to any engagement. If someone's just looking for a, a standard conversation, executive search engagement, I'm probably not gonna be the right person for them. But they're willing to, uh, to do all the stuff I'm talking about and, um, and, and, and you know, have that courage, that discipline, that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, humility, and be willing to explore some of these things you know, about going quiet, about looking inside, um, then, then that's, that's a relationship. That's a coaching engagement. I really get excited about because I see so much growth, so much change. And the stories I get back from business leaders, from, from parents, even from, from children, from athletes, all these different segments, they all see the value of really examining themselves going in, you know, when you pull back an arrow, an archer knows to pull back before it goes forward. You don't just go forward. The arrow is just going to just going to fall down. So you have to go, you go in. I like to teach people to go in before they go out. And the same with building a building, you go down, you build a foundation before you, before you go up. And I think for the last, you know, several hundred years, we've, as a society, we've been running this, this modality, this, this of outward acquisition, this ex, everything external to ourselves. And, and we've seen that that has run its course. And I think, you know, we've been looking looking for an outside fix for an inside job. And I think we need to take a moment to be. We're always focused on do and accomplishment. And I think the more we can just focus on being, it allows us to get to that present state. It allows us to transcend our story and to then, then effectively, effectively move out into the world and do what we need to do in all the roles that we hold. Wow. 
I, I'm r- really impressed and 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 so so touched and moved by that because I I practice mindfulness and meditation and have been for years because I had heard for so long that this was a secret of many successful people that they go in, as you said, and and I kept thinking I should do that. If so many people who are successful preach the value of that and they do that, then I should do that too. And I've done that, but I've primarily kept it to myself. This idea of actually bringing it to your clients is uh, is is wonderful and, uh, and and really makes me think deeply about how I should incorporate that myself in my coaching as you have beautifully done in yours and the results that you've gotten have been really remarkable. It's remarkable. And it doesn't have to be spiritual or religious or anything like that. It's, it's, it's the most natural uh, thing and it's the closest thing to you and, and you have it all the time. So <laughs> it's always there. It's always available. Wow. Well, thank you very much, Robin. Uh, this has been a very interesting interview as I, as I knew it would be. And uh, considering uh, the, the experience that you have and, and the busyness of your life, the, the time that you shared with us is really valuable. I thank you so much. Really enjoyed it, Michael. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. And uh, yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Best wishes.